Today we're going to talk about 3.4, which is Lexington and Concord. So last time we talked about the Intolerable Acts being placed on Boston due to the Boston Tea Party. And so the result of that was the colonists are going to try to support Boston because of the Intolerable Acts, and they're going to hold what is known as the First Continental Congress. And all colonies except Georgia are going to send a representative to Philadelphia. And so at the First Continental Congress, they're going to decide two things. Number one, that everyone is going to agree to, to ban all trade with Britain uh, until the Intolerable Acts are repealed. And even Georgia, even though they did not send a representative, they are going to later agree uh, to, to do what everyone else does and boycott Britain. And the second thing is they are going to all agree to start training troops. Now, Parliament does not give in. So Parliament, which m makes laws over in Britain, uh, they do not repeal the Intolerable Acts. They actually increased restrictions and sent more troops to America. So the colonies are going to begin training militias, which are volunteer soldiers. And they are non-professional troops, meaning they do not get paid. They are volunteers. So a professional army gets paid, like the Redcoats, uh, like the, the French army, the, the militias in America, the Minutemen, like, like in the picture here, they do not get paid. They're volunteers. <clears throat> so these, these people are going to become known as Minutemen. And that's because they are uh, known to be able to be ready to fight in less than a minute. So notice they don't have matching uniforms. They don't have matching uh, shirts or pants or hats. The, just whatever they're wearing, uh, they're, they're ready to fight. They're going to grab their, their rifle, their musket, and they're ready to fight in less than 60 seconds. So they're going to be called Minutemen. Now, there were a lot of redcoats in Boston at this time because of the Sons of Liberty causing problems in Boston, the Tea Party, the Boston Massacre, uh, just everything that's going on, there's a lot of redcoats that are in Boston. And the Sons of Liberty, which is that anti-British gang that is headed by Samuel Adams, uh, this, the Sons of Liberty, they're going to hear that the redcoats are going to try to arrest Samuel Adams, their leader, and John Hancock, who is a part of the Sons of Liberty and a patriot leader. And Samuel Adams and John Hancock, they were, at the time, had been staying in a small town called Lexington, which is not too far away from Boston. And so their plan is, the Redcoats' plan is to march to Lexington in the middle of the night to where it'll be like a surprise uh, when they wake up the next morning. They will be there in Lexington and they will arrest Samuel Adams and John Hancock. Now the problem is the Sons of Liberty hear about it, and so they're going to warn them. Uh, the second part of the mission for the Redcoats is to march on to Concord, which is the next town over from Lexington. And they are going to try to collect these weapons that, that they've heard that the Patriots have a stash of weapons that they're holding in Concord that you know they can use later on for maybe a, a war or something like that. So they have these military supplies saved up and stored in Concord. And the Redcoats find out about it, and their goal is to go find it and either collect them, take them, or destroy these weapons. Now, there's going to be two routes that the British soldiers, the Redcoats, could take out of Boston. They could go one by land uh, through, the, through the Boston Neck, which I'll show you on the next slide, or two, they can cross the Charles River and go by sea, which would be a shortcut. So if you just look at the, the map there first, okay, this, this here is Boston. So it is a peninsula to where, you know, the majority of the town is on this bigger part of the peninsula. And it is connected to the south here by, you know, a, a thin strip of land. And this is going to be known as the, the Boston Neck to where the two options is they could go one by land, which would be they leave Boston here, the Redcoats, and they march down the Boston Neck and then around and then march on to Lexington, which is here. Or they could go two by sea, 
which would be them getting on boats, going across the harbor uh, or across the bay, landing here on foot, and then marching the rest of the way, okay, which would be a little quicker because it's a shortcut. So Paul Revere, we've talked about Paul Revere before. He was the one that used propaganda at the Boston Massacre to try to persuade the audience in the newspaper to join the Patriot cause. Paul Revere is going to be one of the, the, the people that, that call the Boston Massacre the Boston Massacre when really only five people died. So this same Paul Revere is going to arrange, so he's part of the Sons of Liberty, and he's going to here that you know the, the British are coming to try to catch both Samuel Adams and John Hancock. And so Paul Revere is going to arrange to have a signal lit in the Old North Church. So in this church, uh, he could so he would be hanging out uh, somewhere here around Charlestown, Paul Revere would, and he's watching this church that's over in the north side of Boston. And once he sees the lanterns hung in the, the steeple of the church, he now know, will know which way the red coats are going to come. They're either going to go one by land and march around, or they're going to go two by sea. And <clears throat> so it's kind of hard to tell here, but there were actually two lanterns lit in the Old North Church, which means around 10 p.m., the British left Boston by sea. Okay, so they're going to get on a boat, they're going to cross the harbor, and uh, then get on land and try to go to Lexington. So they're taking the shortcut. So Paul Revere, who's on horse, he, he needs to really hurry up. He's, he's going to try to get to Lexington before the Redcoats. He's going to warn everybody along the way, hey, the Redcoats are coming. He's going to try to get all the Minutemen in the area to get to Lexington and maybe hold them off. So Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. The Sons of Liberty were ready for this, okay, so Paul Revere being one of those. Uh, Paul Revere and William Dawes rode out to let the Patriots know that the British were coming. So the, the, blue, the blue mark here, this is, uh, this is where Paul Revere rides. And notice it's not a straight line. He doesn't go straight to Lexington. He goes to Medford first, and he's going to, you know, kind of wind his way through the country and try to get as many people as many Minutemen ready to fight as possible. And this is in the middle of the night. And around midnight, Paul Revere gets to Lexington and warns Samuel Adams and John Hancock that the British are coming, and so you need to leave town. Okay? They're, the Redcoats are coming to arrest you. And so they both leave Lexington. So now Paul Revere is going to head on to Concord, and he needs to tell the people there that the British are coming to collect all the weapons, and so they need to get the one the weapons out of Concord and basically disperse them, uh, hide them somewhere else, this stash of weapons that they have been collecting uh, that they could possibly use in a war in the future. And he's also trying to tell Minutemen, hey, we might have a fight, so, so get ready. And now Hillm and Dawes are going to Hillm Daw, Hillm and Dawes are going to meet up uh, with a guy by the name of Samuel Prescott. Samuel Prescott was not part of the original plan. He was uh, leaving a friend's house late at night, and he was on his horse uh, there between Lexington and Concord. And Paul Revere is going to say, "Hey, will you will you help us spread the word to Concord that the British are coming?" And so he agrees. He says, "Sure, I'll I'll help." Uh, he was from the area, so many people knew who he was. And so he's going to uh, go along with Paul Revere and and William Dawes. And then they're going to end up running into a, a couple red coats. And now realize that there are red coats spread out throughout the countryside and all these small towns because the red coats were also acting as police officers. They they had to make sure that everyone followed, you know, followed the rules, followed the laws because there were no police officers at the time. And so a red coat is actually going to end up capturing Paul Revere here halfway between Lexington and Concord. And so luckily, uh, Prescott is able to run away on his horse and continue to Concord. Now, William, William Dawes, he doesn't, get, he doesn't get captured by the red coats, but he is going to take off on his horse running also, and he's going to end up falling off his horse. Now realize it is the middle of the night. 
Uh, so, you know, it's probably not easy to ride a horse running full speed in the middle of the night. So William Dawes falls off his horse, ends up getting injured. His horse runs off. He can't find it. And so luckily, uh, Prescott is able to make it to Concord around 1.30 in the morning. And they're gonna, he's going to get to town. They're going to ring the church bell and basically warn everybody in the town that the British are coming. And, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're ready to have a fight, then, then go get some guns and get ready for a fight. So Lexington the next morning. So this was the the first the first place they went, Lexington. So now, like I said, the Redcoats they were they were marching by foot. So it's going to take them a little longer to get there from Boston uh, compared to Paul Revere. Paul Revere was on a horse. So early that next morning. Now this is like five six a.m. in the morning, really early, and the Redcoats eight hundred Redcoats are going to make it to Lexington, and they're there. They're hoping that they can find Samuel Adams. They're hoping they can find uh, John Hancock, Okay, but they've already left town. So there are 77 minute men who are waiting on them. So there's 77 minute men waiting for them as they come into Lexington, and they're going to be uh, kind of there in, the, in, in an open field near town. And the Redcoats are going to, as they're marching down the road, they see these minute men armed over uh, in this field. And... So the, the Redcoats redirect and basically go a line across from these 77 Minute Men. Now, these 77 Minute Men, they are stacked in two rows deep, and there's only 77 of them. Okay, and then the, you have the, the British Redcoats, who are one of the strongest armies in the world, and there's 800 of them. So if you could only imagine, it's, it's not a very fair fight. Okay, but the, the Patriot leader, uh, that was leading these minute men, he tells them, do not fire unless fired upon, but if they fire first, then let's have, let them have it. And so the British are going to order these patriots to drop their weapons. They do not. And so you just have this standoff. You have 800 redcoats on one side of the field. You have 77 minute men standing across from them in two rows deep. And it's just a standoff until someone shoots. And what's this shot called? The shot heard around the world. And so why? Why, why is it called around the world? The shot heard around the world when this is just a normal musket shot. You know, it's, it's not any special type of rifle. So the sound of it didn't travel any farther than any other shot. So why do they say it was this shot heard around the world? That's because the world took notice. Okay, It was the first shot of the revolution. Uh, the world wanted to see if America could win. So what I compare it to would be, you know, I tell my students, I say, it would, it would be similar to you going to a UFC event, a fighting, a fighting event, and you jumping up there in, in, the, in the ring and basically taking on the best UFC fighter or a professional UFC fighter. And, you know, my students having no training in fighting. Everyone would want to watch that. You know, people would pay money to watch that on pay-per-view because most people are going to think that you're, you know, that that student or myself, you know, if, if I was the one fighting, that, you know, that UFC fighter is probably going to hurt them. And... So, you know, even though every, everybody's wanting to watch it just because, you know, it's an unfair fight, but at the same time, everybody that's watching is going to be rooting for that underdog. Everybody's going to be rooting for, you know, me versus that UFC fighter or uh, my students versus that UFC fighter because everybody loves an underdog story. Now, who shot first? No one knows. Okay, I, if I had a guess, I would say I would say the Americans because – the Redcoats were so well trained. They were so disciplined. They had they showed so much discipline normally that normally the Redcoats, you know, they they marched when they were told to march. They aimed when they were told to aim. They fired when they were told to fire. They charged when they're told to charge. They retreat when they're told to retreat. That these people had been trained their entire lives for this, that most of the time they were always the more disciplined, the more disciplined army on the on every field. And these 77 minute men, they were not trained. They were not disciplined. So if I had to guess, I bet it was one of those 77 minute men that shot first. But we can't prove that. 
Now, the battle lasted for 10 minutes, uh, and eight minute men died. Okay, a couple more were injured. And now these 77 minute men, they're they're not completely dumb. They don't just line up across these this field and sit there and try to try to defeat the the British redcoats. They realize they're outnumbered numbered 800 to 77. So once they shoot, so once the first person shoots, now gunfire is exchanged. And so the colonists are going to start shooting. The redcoats are going to start shooting. The colonists now, once they shoot, they're going to turn and run, you know, and they'll try to try to find a spot to hide and reload and then maybe get another shot off. Uh, but they're not just going to, you know, try to take the field. They know they have no chance at that. And so it only lasts about 10 minutes. Uh, then and then the Redcoats are going to continue on their mission of looking through Lexington. They're trying to find Samuel Adams and John Hancock. They're both gone. They're going to set fire to some of the buildings in Lexington, causing smoke. Uh, and then the British are going to continue on to their mission. They're going to march on to Concord and look for the stash of Patriot guns that they have heard about. Now, in Concord, the British marched on to destroy these military this military supplies in Concord. It had already been moved, thanks to Prescott getting there and warning the town. So a battle was fought at the, at the town's north bridge, forcing the British to retreat to Boston. So now, this is later in the day. You know, Lexington happened 5, 6 a.m. in the morning, super early. And by the time they searched for the Patriot leaders and you know, look through town and then march on to Concord, you know, it's the middle of the day now. And so now by this time, the Patriots have been able, or the, the colonists have been able to get a lot more Minutemen ready to go. And so at Concord, they're going to have the British outnumbered. And so the Redcoats realize this. And so they're going to get to this, uh, to this bridge and they're not going to be able to, to advance. And then the, the colonists or these Minutemen are going to basically chase them back to Boston. And you got to realize these Redcoats, they are, they are tired. They've marched many miles already. They started at 10 o'clock the night before. So they did not sleep. They did not eat okay, all night, all morning. Uh, and, and they fought, you know, in two different battles now. And, you know, one of them being a, a very short battle. Uh, but they're wore out. And here they are, you know, getting outnumbered by the, the, the Minutemen. And so they're forced to retreat back to Boston. Now, the problem for them is that there are nearly 4,000 Minutemen lining the roads back to Boston. Now, they are hiding behind trees and rocks. So look at the picture here. Okay, so here's the road back to Boston. And you're going to have these Minutemen that are going to be up in the hills, hiding behind rocks and trees from both sides from both sides of the road, and they're going to be shooting into these redcoats. And these redcoats, they really have no way to defend themselves. So the only thing they can do is run. And so they're going to run all the way back to Boston to where they have safety. And bad news for the redcoats. So there were very few casualties at Lexington and, Con and Concord. Okay, Lexington, very few casualties. Concord, very few casualties. Not enough to say this person will, or this, this side won or that side won. It was basically a draw, but the trip back to Boston is where the Minutemen destroyed over half of the Redcoat Army. So after the first day of battle, the Minutemen take the victory, and it was all due to the march back to Boston is where the Minutemen are going to kill over half of the Redcoat Army. So this is a major win for the Minutemen, the, the colonists, to where these people are going to have confidence. This is, you know, they just defeated one of the strongest armies in the world on the first day of battle here. And uh, so they're, they're all super excited. So now following Lexington and Concord, we're going to have the Second Continental Congress. So representatives from all 13 colonies would show up this time in Philadelphia. Originally, the First Continental Congress, remember that's when they uh, basically boycott Britain and start training troops. Now we have Lexington, Lexington and Concord happen, the shot heard around the world. And now we have the Second Continental Congress. All 13 representatives, or all 13 colonies send representatives, including Georgia. And they would do two things. One, they would create a Continental Army. Now, this is not a militia. This is a professional army. So the soldiers should be paid. We'll talk about if they get paid later on. Uh, but 
This is going to be soldiers from all over the 13 colonies, not just one place. And it's supposed to be professionals. They're getting paid for it. And they're going to name George Washington as the commander of this army. So if you're taking notes, make a, make a T-chart. On the left side, we're going to have event. On the right side, we're going to have results. So a little bit of a review here, but the French and Indian War, uh, that's the event. The result of that, the king and Britain started taxing the colonists to repay for war debt. The Boston Massacre, okay, the result of that was that the U.S. created the Committee of Correspondence, which improved communication among the colonies. We have the Boston Tea Party, where the Sons of Liberty dumped a lot of tea into the Boston Harbor. And the result of that is the king is going to place the intolerable acts on Boston. Because of the intolerable acts being placed on Boston, we're going to have the first Continental Congress meet. That's where they boycott all trade with Britain and start training troops. And then we're going to have Lexington and Concord shot heard around the world. And the result is a second Continental Congress meet 